The moment I heard what the topic of today's panel would be, I agreed to, to moderate it. And it was because, not just for the, the obvious reason, which is that if this is an incredibly important topic, mental illnesses are incredibly prevalent, they tend to be chronic, the healthcare system is not very well set up to deal with them, parity is still pretty patchy, and then of course there's stigma, which figures prominently in our, in our program today. But I also had this very strong emotional response, a personal response, a kind of a click with feelings that I've been dealing with both in my personal life and my professional life, especially over the last year or so. And it's this feeling that the greatest challenges to my ability to be compassionate tend to be related to mental illness. But it's just hard to distinguish, it can be hard to distinguish between what is mental illness and what is just personality, what is a, a person's behavior. And I'd summarize this challenge as, I know that things are very difficult for you, the person with mental illness, but, you're make, but this is making things very difficult for me too. And I wondered, um, actually, and I wrote, in, I don't write in my journal much anymore, but I wrote in my journal recently, Here's what makes me angriest, that I can't be as compassionate as I feel like I should be. And so I wondered, like, do healthcare providers also face a challenge something like this? And they're already be call, be, being called on to be so much more compassionate than the rest of us. And here is this heightened challenge. And do they find themselves acting differently with patients with mental illness? And is that a problem? And so I thought today we would be talking about, mainly about stigma, but also just about difficulty, that mental illness presents particular challenges in the healthcare system. Not too long ago, I presented at the ER of a large academic teaching hospital in Boston that will remain nameless. <laughs> yeah at the ER, and upon revealing that I was on antipsychotic medication and I had schizophrenia, I was triaged to the psychiatric ER. I had presented for a pain painful medical condition, but I was triaged to the psychiatric ER. All my belongings were taken away from me. I was tested for illegal narcotics, I was placed in a glass-walled room, and I was given a sitter until my doctor came. It was as if having a psychiatric condition negated the possibility of having a medical condition. Mine, it turns out, was not an isolated case. There's a 2013 New York Times article written by Julianne Gary called When Doctors Discriminate. And in it she writes, at least 14 studies have shown that people with serious mental illness receive worse medical care than normal people. We can all figure out what normal people means. You can ponder that one. When someone with a psychiatric condition has a physical complaint, the caregivers, instead of attending to the problem as expressed by the person, often ignore it or chalk it up to a psychosomatic condition rather than a medical need. So why does this matter? This matters because we know, we know that people with psychiatric conditions are dying 25 years earlier of preventable illnesses than people without psychiatric conditions. If somebody goes to the doctor and it's humiliating or somebody is disregarded, they're less likely to go to the doctor. I know in my own life, it's very difficult for me to see a new provider, a podiatrist, a dentist, because I'm afraid of what they're going to think when they find out I'm on antipsychotic medication. It's about how as a society, we view people with psychiatric conditions. And then there's a ripple effect. This is the medical community. How does this play off to the media and the public? 
when we talk about compassion, uh, I think of it as existing in our world at two levels. Compassion for the patient, the person in recovery, and compassion for the family. Uh, I think it was Carrie uh, who said, uh, uh, am I as compassionate as I can be when I'm presented with a person with mental illness? We parents ask that question all the time because we have the same emotions. We're upset, we're angry, we're frustrated. Uh, we have uh, mixed emotions. Is it our fault? Even though at an intellectual level we know it's not, um, the research is good there. Uh, but we still feel it. Um, and so we have all of these. And above it all is, uh, are we compassionate enough? Are we patient enough? Uh, and it's a question that never has a full answer. So, um, um, so these two levels, Lisa's represents one, and I think I represent uh, another. And, and I think it's important to appreciate uh, the challenges families have at, at both these levels. I want to talk about an experience I had. It was the first experience I had uh, with an inpatient a commitment situation. Uh, and it happened five years ago when my uh, son had his first uh, major psychotic episode, um, manic episode, and he found himself in an inpatient. So because Lisa let off, I won't name the inpatient. <laughs> I have it right here, but I'm not going to name it. Uh, because, and, it, and by the way, it's no different anywhere. I've been, I, uh, my son has had 10 uh, inpatient stays over two and a half years. Thankfully, the last one was two and a half years ago. And, uh, and uh, you know, nobody escapes criticism. In, ter in the terms that I'm going to talk about, uh, and I have the experience, uh, unfortunately, to know it. So the first time, uh, I met, along with my son, the psychiatrist who was, uh, who was on duty with my son. And he sat over there, excuse me, I sat over here, and my son sat over there, and he alternatively cross-examined us. <laughs> and I felt that I was a little on trial. Now, I was very sensitive. You know, I, it, it, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, in fact, I'm quite sure I wasn't seeing it 2020, but that's the way I felt. I felt that I was, uh, you know, so part of the problem. And it was, I, I, I will never forget that experience. The reason I, I, I mention it is because it was only half the experience I had. Two days later, I went back and there was a different person on duty who could not have been warmer. Uh, and I think he, he was, uh, uh, from Mexico. He came up and he, he didn't embrace me, but I felt embraced. I'm so sorry this is happening. You know, I, I, you know, I hope there's something we can do. It was so different. And I, you know, and I thought, okay, there's the worst, and here's what's possible. So it's not, oh, they're not trained to be this way? Thank God there is a there is a, a, a better way. And I will tell you, this has been played out many, many times, not only uh, for me, but for everyone in my situation, families in my situation. I teach a course uh, called Family to Family. It's a, a, a NAMI, it's a NAMI course. It's a wonderful course for family members, not for the person, for the loved one who's suffering, but for the family who's suffering. Parents, siblings, spouses, adult children of aging uh, parents. And so I've heard dozens and dozens of stories, and this is one of the leading stories. The psychiatrist, the psychologist won't listen to me. I can't communicate. I can't offer anything. And usually the citation is to HIPAA, OK? But it totally, you know, it's totally, as we all know, it's totally wrong. You know, first of all, <laughs> You can ask the patient, do you mind? Uh, and if the answer is yes, problem solved. But even if the, the, the patient says, I'm uncomfortable, um, that in no way blocks the uh, psychiatrist or, uh, or uh, therapist from listening. Because who knows more about his or her patient than family members? There's a wealth of knowledge and background um, to offer. But it unfortunately has been the rule rather than the exception that that, uh, that that information is sought 
or even accepted. And, and that's it's simply unacceptable. It's changing. Um, it's changing because of meetings like this that are going on all over the place where people like us who are professionals and family members and people in recovery are talking about it. So we're making progress, but we've got a long way to go. When we use this troubled word stigma, we're usually referring to the double burden on people and families of coping with psychiatric symptom of some kind, doing the hard work of recovery, and being met by prejudice all around them, from landlords, employers, friends and family, uh, police, and healthcare providers. Now, healthcare providers, have, I, I would say we, um, <laughs> have our own troubles. We carry not only all of the baggage shared by all, but we have an amplified sense of responsibility and obligation to do good. And it sometimes gets in our own way. Um, for healthcare providers, um, look, people go into this field to help. In order to do that, you have to have some capacity to know what you're facing and know what to do. So Steve is exactly right. It has a lot to do with competence. We, we rely day to day, moment to moment, on the belief that we have expertise, that we have skill in diagnosis and knowing what to do. Um, and in the absence of that, we get very uncomfortable. So let, let me give you one example that has to do with a particular specialty that, specialty that is generally beyond reproach. I mean, really, who could have a gripe with pediatricians, right? Yeah. Generally, generally, relatively underpaid, mission-driven, there for the kiddos, as they call them, right? And the parents. Not long ago, only eight, ten years ago, the common circumstance in a private practice pediatrician's office was that um, the, the waiting room would be filled, still with a lot of kids with infectious diseases, and then somebody who was going to really turn the whole day upside down. The kid who came allegedly for a headache or a stomach ache to get past the gatekeeper of the nurse answering the phone, but who was really there for something else. Right? And when that painfully distressed young teenage girl was examined and tearfully revealed the scars on her thigh where she had been secretly cutting herself, or the teenage boy acknowledged that, well, actually, it was not totally an accident that he crashed the car and it was lucky that nobody tested his sobriety or whatever it was. The whole day was shot for the pediatrician because they were now faced with trying to understand something for which they had not been trained and they had to figure it out on the spot and find resources which in many cases are not readily available. So a groundswell built because in those waiting rooms, now very well documented in the pediatrics literature, the proportion of kids presenting for sick visits with infectious disease, the flu, earache, strep throats, you, all the usual stuff has started to go down. And the proportion of kids in their waiting room with mental health, developmental and autism spectrum disorders, psychiatric onset, or substance abuse, misuse or, or abuse has gone up. And so the pediatrician started to come to a lot of us at the front of this room and say, you've got to help us. You've got to do something. You've got to be more like the cardiologist. You've got to be somebody we can readily turn to who can tell us what to do. 
Now, ideally, they were also asking if we could just take, take the kids off their hands. <laughs> and we basically said, there are not enough of us, but what we can do is deputize you. We can train you. We can prepare you. We can help you to feel competent. And we can set up a backup system of consultative support to give you a fighting chance. So along the way, we've had a lot of help from everyone at my right and left. Uh, we were able to create something called the Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Project, written about by folks yes, <laughs> uh, like Carrie, inspired by folks like Lisa, made possible by uh, class action litigation <laughs> by folks <laughs> like Steve, <laughs> and, and the court-ordered remedy of the Rosie D. lawsuit ultimately requiring funding made possible by folks like Mary Lou through the Children's Mental Health Campaign and now more robustly funded in her governmental role. It's made it possible for us to provide six regional teams of child psychiatrist, social worker, and resource coordinator so that a pediatrician can guaranteed within 30 minutes and often much more quickly while parent and kid are still set, sitting in the office, address any question or any challenge they face. And more systematically has allowed us to train pediatricians to understand what walk, just walked in the door, to do screenings and be paid at least enough to keep doing it at every well child visit at every age to begin to diagnose things early, to make timely referrals, to achieve what we call rational triage, hanging on to the things that they ought and sending to, the to us the things that we can better handle rather than the reverse. And all of that, I think, has changed the landscape for pediatricians so that they just feel better about it. And we've documented that with satisfaction surveys and whatnot, but the bottom line is they're much will more willing now to go there and have confidence in their competence and treat people with much more respect and warmth as they do for everything else, rather than with dread and fear. But when I think of um, three words I'd like to leave you with is, um, it's not just competence and compassion, it is also humility. It's incredibly important for us to recognize what we don't know. And when it comes to the world of mental health and mental illness, there is a lot together that we don't know. Um, and for every dollar that's spent in research in the United States, it's like a penny is spent on mental health and substance abuse disorders um, treatment research. So we have a long ways to go before we are really competent. So I think it's really important to also be humble about what we don't know. Um, I have been very public. It took me a while to get there um, because like so many, when I was in training uh, as a social worker and in my early days as a social worker with wonderful people like Donna Mosh, who's here today, one of my mentors, um, I talked like everybody else did, mental health in the third person as if it affected somebody else, but never in my family. And so in the early days of um, advocating for mental health parity, I realized I was being really disingenuous by talking about mental health in a third party, when the reality is mental illness runs in three generations of my family, not always with good outcomes. And in some ways it doesn't, um, it doesn't really comport anymore um, in terms of how much uh, medicine has advanced to talk about my mother's experience. And in fact, she died from a result of her mental illness because like so many people in the days of the 60s and 70s, or actually she died um, in 1970, um, we didn't believe it was an illness. People thought of my mother as lazy, even though she was a single mom with three daughters, worked every day up until the last six months of her life and for a long time actually couldn't manage to get up the stairs to the bedroom. That's how exhausted she was as a result of her mental illness. And I really didn't appreciate, um, I was sort of an angry teenager um, because I was sort of having to take care of everything else in the family and I couldn't quite figure out myself 
why my mother couldn't get up the stairs. And like many people, she treated her um, profound clinical depression um, with alcohol. So she actually died from cirrhosis, cirrhosis four days after her 40th birthday. And for the last six months of her life, I took care of her as her primary case manager. And I, was, I got mad at insurance companies. I knew everything that you shouldn't have to know at the age of 15 about utilization management <laughs> and um, um, medical necessity criteria. I remember going through this huge Blue Cross Blue Shield document. We were in another state thinking, so what is this UR thing people are talking to me about? What's this medical necessity thing? My mother's really sick. But that was sort of my lens into mental illness. Um, if I leap forward, I have a niece in another state um, who has schizoaffective illness. She's doing quite well now. She's an artist. Um, she has a patchwork of services and supports. She would tell you it doesn't hurt to have a former commish. That's what she refers to me as. Um, instead of Aunt Mary Lou, it's former commish. Um, I told her now she can call me secretary, and she says, oh, do you answer the phones? Yeah. Um, <laughs> If ever I want to have my ego like just, I just talk to my niece. But um, um, as she had lots of struggles, um, including um, uh, and relief actually when she uh, finally got a diagnosis, which actually made a whole lot of sense to everybody, including her of schizoaffective illness. Um, I actually was one of the people who actually suggested to her to not disclose what her illness her diagnosis was. And she felt at one point, so she works, she's got her associate's degree. Like I said, she has a good patchwork. And she works at a place where she felt she had a really good um, relationship with someone. And she felt it was safe to disclose her illness. Because the person knew she had to take uh, medication certain times during the day, and there would be times when she would get um, stressed, and she knows very well how to manage the anxiety part of her schizoaffective illness. Um, and her friend asked her. And so she would just say she had an illness that she had to manage. And then she felt it was safe. And so she disclosed to her friend, her friend that she had schizoaffective illness. And my niece describes it as if she had the plague. The person literally recoiled, stepped back, and never made eye contact or talked to my niece again. Wow. My niece. Um, was devastated, quit her job, couldn't go back to work, couldn't face, and for the very first time was rehospitalized in more than, she hadn't been hospitalized. In fact, we, we generally kept her out of the hospital, um, but had had probably one hospitalization in her life. And actually, it created that spiral, and she had a brief hospitalization, and she's back, sort of on her feet again. But I tell you that um, not to make you feel um, sad or bad, and you know, she has resources, she has me, she has family and the like, but it is the power of words. So I want to sort of just leave you with a couple of thoughts, and then we, um, I know we want to talk about, um, hear your questions. The power of language. I recoil when I hear people use the term the mentally ill. It is dehumanizing. We would never talk about the cancers. You know, the last time I looked, there are people like my mom who suffered from clinical depression, and I have a niece who has schizoaffective illness, and there's a whole lot in between. It is not the mentally ill as if it's a homogeneous group of people. Um, people with mental illnesses are people who have a variety of symptoms and diagnoses, and they need to be treated with the dignity that we all want to be treated with when we have whatever illness we have. So I just want to put that out there. Um, I was honored to be asked here today because um, it is rare, if ever, I attach compassion with mental health. And so I applaud the Schwartz Center for actually embracing compassion within mental health because we have a long ways to go. And then the one other um, um, thing I would leave you with, and I know it makes some people in the room nervous, is I made the leap a long time ago that when I talk about health, it is about mental health, oral health, and physical health. That the segregation of mental health from the medical profession has not served our community well at all.
And so I'm up for an entirely different conversation about a, how to integrate behavioral and physical health care because the consequences of not results in things as um, our good friend Steve Rosenfeld said, which is that the cost of a, to care for someone, it's not that they cost more, it's just in our worlds we're not doing a good job providing services to people with mental illness, is two and a half times more per person who has a comorbid condition than if they have one or the other. So we're wasting a whole lot of money, we're not coming out with really good outcomes, and we're not treating people with mental illnesses and addiction disorders with the dignity that they deserve. Um, and the last thing I would say is families and loved ones, and I take the same thing. Like when, when people ask me who my family is and I start to describe them, they're like, there's no family connection there. So like people like Donna Mosh is part of my family. You know, we're not blood related. So my family is like this big extended messy group of people, but they're my family and they know a lot about me. And they can talk to treaters and medical professionals and the like about what they see. And that's incredibly important as we help people with mental illnesses and addiction disorders recover. And yes, people do recover from their illnesses. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I think let's all start thinking of the questions that we would like to ask the panelists. Uh, while you think of yours, I'm going to ask the most obvious one, which is the what is to be done. And I'd like each panel, and in the case of Mary Lou Sutter's, what are you going to do, <laughs> secretary? So, um, so let's begin with Lisa and go down the line. And just, I, there are so many things, but just a couple of them. What are the most crying out things that need to be done and that perhaps might be relevant to this audience? Sure. Um, a couple things. First of all, I just want to echo what Mary Lou said about the power of language and that people do recover and the conjoining too. Um, I just thought it was so powerful and so eloquently said, so I just wanted to echo that. Um, what can be done? Um, with psychiatric diagnosing, um, education is a major game changer in the field and also with compassion, um, I'm a big believer of high expectations. And this comes from my own experience. Um, when I was on medical leave from graduate studies at Harvard, um, I lost the ability to read and write and my IQ was measured at 70, which is borderline mental retardation. So it was a very quick descent. And my mother started commuting from Los Angeles to Boston and she started reading to me, and she chose children's books to try to elicit some familiarity. So Bar Bar, Curious George, Make Way for Ducklings, all the classics, to try to jog some familiarity. We did word puzzles and played with Play-Doh and colored and coloring books. But they had high expectations that I would return to graduate school. But where did the compassion come in? The compassion came in with baby steps. I took baby steps that I would return to graduate school. I'm a big believer that anybody can recover. Recovery takes high expectations. Compassion is about recovery and high expectations. It's about holding high expectations, holding the bar high for somebody, and planning for somebody to get over that bar. We can hold the bar high for somebody to get over that bar and then take baby steps along the way. So having compassion. Another piece of the puzzle is education. After my ordeal in the ER, I wrote an article and published it in a textbook, Emergency Psychiatry. So just a warning to that hospital. <laughs> Do you name I it? I write articles. Yes. <laughs> I called it triage and truth. Some of the university classes that I lecture for use it in their syllabus. At McLean, where I was twice hospitalized, I go back and do something called the good outcomes didactic where I lecture to second year medical residents on my experience. They ask me questions. 
what does akathisia actually feel like? Mm -hmm. And what is the difference of being insecure and feeling paranoia? And I try to answer as best I can. And I start young. I talk to sixth graders about my experience and try to paint a picture of what schizophrenia actually feels like. We don't know who our future caregivers are going to be, so we need to paint a wide swath. We need to deliver education to a wide array of people because we don't know who our future doctors and nurses are going to be. Thank you. Thank you. Steve. Uh, well, since I can't top that, I'm going <laughs> to take a turn. I, I just want to focus on one thing, and it really comes uh, from what Mary Lou said. It connects with, first I want to say this. There's so much to do. In this field, there's so much to do. I'm now chairman of the board of NAMI, and things appear daily that just aren't interesting to do. They must be done. And so trying to cope with that, um, it, just as advocates, is enormous, like nothing I've, uh, I've ever uh, encountered. So there's so much to do. So let me just focus on one thing. Mary Lou mentioned her mother uh, and then mentioned her niece. Both, you know, in, in workplace related, but I'm particularly riveted on her niece, who confided and suffered as a result. We have a big problem in the workplace. Um, workplace productivity is undermined by mental illness more than any other condition. Um, and, 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 the, and the statistics are clear. It's the number one uh, uh, cause of disability, workplace disability, and it's also a huge issue because people stay on the job with mental issues because they are worried about disclosing, so they try to tough it out. And there's a phenomenon called presenteeism. You're sick, but you stay on the job. This is a terrible problem. Um, all, I, I'm going to bet almost all of you are in a workplace. And so there's something you can do in your workplace to make sure that it as, is as safe and welcoming uh, and therapeutic as a workplace can be. We've got a lot of work to do. Uh, at NAMI, we're starting a, a, an initiative called CEOs Against Stigma. Yes. Terrific grant from the Attorney General uh, last year, two-year program to enlist CEOs from the top to uh, either uh, use if, if they're there already, use their culture as an example, example, but more likely to look at the culture of their workplace and take specific steps to improve it. Um, and it's because we, we, we're doing this because the research shows that although, we, we did a survey on this last year, um, uh, people surveyed would advise someone with mental illness, tell your family. 92% say, tell your family. Um, 82% say, tell your friend. 27% say, tell your coworker. You know, and that was, we just did the survey. That wasn't even the main point of our survey, but it just popped out and it made it clear that there's so much work to do and we're gonna try to do some of it, but you have the power uh, to do significant work uh, to help stigma in the workplace as well. Thank you. Joe. So I'd say four things. First, um, we have to do better helping families. Um, we use this unfortunate word, case manager. Um, no human being is a case and nobody wants to be managed. <laughs> we, we, we've got social workers, psychologists, physicians, siblings, parents, loved ones, these are the folks who are care helping by whatever word you want to use. Too often, you have to rise to a threshold of having really suffered a long enough time, a severe enough degree in order to be granted a case manager outside of your family. Up until that point, most folks are burdened in the way that you were. Um, fortunately, the good news is that 
financial incentives are beginning to align with best practice. Many of the payers are more creatively looking at how to provide intensive care management. There's movement afoot that's helpful. Um, second, um, we've got to make evidence-based treatments more readily available. The good news is there are a ton of them now. I don't, I'm not allowed enough minutes to list them all for you, and they've all got catchy acronyms and abbreviations, but the truth is for autism spectrum disorders, for anxiety disorders, for depression, for OCD, for um, psychotic disorders, just keep going. You, there's a clear roadmap now to well-proven, effective treatments, many of them non-pharmacological, many of them involve talking in a more prescribed or manualized way that really works. But the workforce of people skilled in providing them is not large enough, and the match in the marketplace of a person seeking care and getting the right kind is not there yet. Um, the third has to do with the theme of uh, we as them, Kimosabi. It's um, <laughs> the false separations of healthcare providers from patients, the false separations of medical from mental health, the false separations of bodily from spiritual are all starting to fortunately teeter and get broken down. And some of them, uh, in part, again, uh, financially driven because the burden on all of us of healthcare costs is so large that it's forcing us to be a little bit more open to new ideas. Uh, um, finally, the conversation is active. We've got to really better integrate medical and mental health care in exactly the way that you're talking about. I apologize to you on behalf of whoever did that in the ER. It, but it's still happening, right? It's still happening that you walk in with an earache and you get directed someplace else because of the labels that we use. A couple of very quick things about that. Um, mental health and addictions problems are prevalent. They are common. They are in all of our families. Every single one of us knows and loves someone and works with someone who is besieged in this way, and we want to fix it. There are also a couple of things catapulting forward, like tidal waves, including autism spectrum disorder, that are just more and more prevalent. And so we've got to deal with all of these things. We have some people of great wisdom in our community. There's a woman named Margaret Bauman, some folks here may know in the autism community, who's really taught the whole country that when a little kid on the spectrum presents with new severe behavioral problems, hitting themselves, injuring themselves, attacking the people around them, duh, the first thing that you should think of is that they have an ear infection a strep throat, right? GERD, we say, right? Mm -hmm. Reflux, constipation, all the things that other kids get. There's nothing about having a developmental disorder or a psychiatric problem that makes you immune from all the stuff that everybody else gets. But this is like a revolutionary thought, <laughs> right? Right? So, for many reasons, we're now starting to get there. Um, there's broad recognition that cost can only be controlled if mental health issues are addressed at the same time as physical, that um, all of the CMS, Medicaid, Medicare demonstration projects have demonstrated that the vast majority of the healthcare dollar is spent on those folks who are besieged by a combination of chronic medical and significant mental health issues. And if either one goes unaddressed, their health care costs go through the roof. So all of these things have to be brought together, the powerful new push toward the medical home and its variation, the behavioral health home, for those who are so 
psychiatrically besieged that they won't go to a primary care doctor, but they might go to a psychiatric setting and we could sneak medical care in there. All of these things are moving us in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. And Mary Lou. <laughs> Um, so a couple of things. Um, I think it does actually start with um, professional education, whether it's social work schools, medical schools, um, schools of psychology, that um, uh, even in schools of social work, we can do um, a lot better in really uh, bringing in the voices of families and individuals with mental illnesses into our, I was a professor also in a little brief uh, for a couple of years before um, uh, becoming secretary. Uh, and even I was in a school that's a top 10 school and it does a lot on cognitive behavioral therapies and the other sort of talking therapies that are more structured therapies. We still have a long ways to go in really um, teaching our students around working, um, even in social work, um, really compassionately um, uh, partnering with individuals and their families. And, and I think actually Boston College does a, I'll put a plug for my, the school that I taught at, I think they actually do a pretty good job. Um, we, we can do a lot more, and certainly in the medical um, education lot. So I think we have a lot, a long ways to go in that. But let me sort of talk a little bit about being a secretary and my role as secretary, since unless I'm the shortest lived secretary of health and human services, which is always a possibility in the Commonwealth, <laughs> but I don't think so, I'm hoping not, is to actually use the Mass Health Program, which is um, 1.7 million residents of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was 1.9 when the connector failed, so we sort of blobbed up for a little bit there because couldn't figure out people's eligibility. But really using the Mass Health Program to drive um, towards integrating behavioral and physical health care. Um, now that's not a one size fits all, so everybody says, well, what does that mean? Does that mean embedded social workers in primary care practices? Probably. Um, and does that mean that behavioral health providers could be medical homes? Probably. Um, but in a much different, uh, really having, using MassHealth um, um, and its power as both a purchaser and um, in its role as um, public policy to start driving the change in Massachusetts around really integrating behavioral and physical health care.